Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here's your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth Show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe subscribe to the RSS feed and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn more about investing in real estate in different markets, there's a show for that. If you want to learn 17 ways rich people think and act differently, there's a show for that. If you want to know how to get paid to borrow, there's a show for that. And if you'd like to know why Amsterdam doesn't take dollars or why pools are for fools, there are even shows for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. My pleasure to welcome Mark Linsenmeyer to the show. He is the founder and one of the hosts of a podcast entitled The Partially Examined Life. And this is a flippant but generally well-informed philosophy podcast. And it's great to have him join us here from Madison, Wisconsin today. Mark, welcome. How are you? I'm doing great. Thanks, Jason. Good to be here. Likewise. Good to have you. So your your story is rather interesting. A degree in philosophy, and I assume you were probably going to look for a professorship or go into teaching, right, of, of some sort? Uh, that was the idea. I mean, the, the premise for the podcast is that we're all philosophy graduate school dropouts. So uh, I recall Matt, Matt Groening of uh, Simpsons fame calling grad school dropouts the most bitter people in the world or something like that. Um, so that that's kind of some of the reputation that we're building on here is that that we're all folks that we got through the program, we didn't get kicked out, we got fine grades and everything, but the job market was not so great, or maybe we just weren't wanting to do that with all of our time. So the partially examined part of the partially examined life is, you know, that you have to kind of stop doing philosophy at some point and, and do other things. And, 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 and actually do life <laughs> rather than think about it. Well, you know, I always loved philosophy as a subject area when I was a student. just thought it was really, really interesting to, to learn about philosophy and so forth. But so I, I guess what you were saying is there weren't a ton of openings for professorships nowadays, huh? <laughs> I'm, being, well, I'm being somewhat sarcastic when I say that. I know it's right, obvious. Certainly. Right, certainly. And also just it's a lifestyle choice if you want to go and live in you know, Montana or North Dakota or whatever that it's like being in the army, just following the jobs where the jobs are. And I was not prepared to do that. I, I was used to living in Austin, which was very nice and uh, had family up in Madison and just uh, would rather have, you know, so I just moved blind without a, even a, any job set up. When I, when I finished with graduate school. I also did cover my bases and in my last year in graduate school there, I got a, a uh, library and information science degree. So I was able to, to between that and, you know, certainly there are a lot of marketable skills out of a, a, a philosophy degree in terms of uh, communications and things. So, yeah, so I did a number of years in marketing communications and uh, answering requests for proposals for technology companies, for medical software, for uh, IP telephony, um, now work uh, in transportation research communications. So all these things helped get me in a mind of making difficult concepts accessible to regular people. That's really what all, it's, you know, whether it's software documentation or explaining why it's great that uh, the federal government put money into some new pavement mix. It's all just a matter of breaking down the technical stuff. So it, so it goes down easy. Uh, and so that's exactly the kind of skill that I learned in philosophy graduate school and was uh, happy to use for this particular outlet, which is meant to serve exactly people like you that maybe took a course in college, 
thought it was fun, but you know, didn't really know what else to do with it. And there's just this, this great divide between the, the plentiful information and philosophy available on the web, which is all very, you know, very much, a lot of it is very right, oriented to other professionals. It's a, it's a, it's the ivory tower, of course. It's a close knit group. So being able to bring some of that down to earth, um, and there are other philosophy podcasts doing that that kind of thing. The difference maybe between theirs and ours is a lot of them are just well, there are all these great professionals in the field. Let's just interview them, see what they have to say, and put their put their work out there. And really, that the the missing element is just the internet itself. That just being able to put a lecture and get it in somebody's hands is going to be good. And that's you know, there's something to be said for that. And we've we've had uh, some. Uh, big time professionals as, as guests as well, but primarily what we do, we didn't even have guests for the first many episodes. And then when we did, it was guest participants. It was, so we were all sort of fellow learners and we actually read a whole text beforehand and then just kind of talk through it and, you know, let it go onto tangents and into popular culture and just, Right. We even put an explicit tag uh, as far as iTunes is concerned on all the episodes, not just because we feel the need to swear all the time, but just because if it happens, it happens. It just it's a I, actually I, I more think of it that people under 18 are not going to be interested enough in what we're talking about, that it matters particularly. And I'm sure that they have ways of, of getting to us, but despite the explicit <laughs> yeah, warning, if right, they, right. they're so inclined. Fair, fair enough. So, Mark, now, when did you start the show? Uh, so this is uh, we just. Hit three years last month. Okay, congratulations, three-year anniversary. And yep, how many yep. episodes so far? So 54, and each of those is it's an hour to two hours. So we, we oh, so lo- this. longer episodes. Uh-huh. Right, we, we really, the, the, the thing that we're trying to capture and convey here is the, the joy of a philosophy graduate seminar. That might not, not sound like a joy to folks not familiar with it, but, uh, and actually even more so, the going to the bar after the seminar and talking over the material. So, you know, a typical seminar in, when I was in there is, is about two and a half hours. So that's around how long we talk and we stop because we're tired. And then, but then I go back and very ruthlessly edit it. And I think that's kind of been the key to actually making it accessible to, to, uh, you know, not only when, when required to stop and explain things uh, so that we're not just, you know, insider baseball, insider f- professional philosophy talk as much as possible, but also just being ruthless and just taking it down. In fact, when I listen to other podcasts, I tend to listen to them at double speed just because I don't want to wait for them to think about what they have to right, say. I just right, want them to yeah. say it. I, I, only, so, I, I yeah. so wish if you're using like an iPhone or an iOS device to listen as I do, I wish they had one and a half times speed. Double's a little too fast for me, but I'd like something in between. I, I, I can't wait till they make that, I, and I'm sure they probably will at some point make it adjustable. So. Well, it's on iTunes U. They uh-huh. have a one and a half times speed. So I found that useful for watching lectures and things like that or, or listening through that. But yes, uh, we're not university affiliated, so we, we are still in the regular podcast section, which is probably easier to market and get the word out anyway. I exactly, suppose. exactly. So 54 episodes, three years. You're, you're not publishing super often. I mean, you know, some podcasters try to like publish every week or so. And, you know, how much time would you say you're spending? Because you say you read a, a text with your, your co-host or guest participants each time and then talk through it. So your podcast probably has a decent amount of preparation and production time. I know that you said, and on the technical side, I'd like you to talk about the way you record and then and mesh together multi-tracks and so forth. So uh, how much time does it take you to produce an episode? I'm not entirely sure, but it's a lot. It's a, uh, yes, it's, we record about once every three weeks, sometimes more often, uh, occasionally less. Uh, usually, uh, you know, sometimes a discussion will spill over and we find even after two hours, we still want to talk more about it. So we'll just, okay, we'll record part two next week and then we don't have to read something additional. But it, it could be, a couple of articles. It could be uh, a, a, you know, a couple times when we've had professors on, we try to read their actual whole book to talk with it about them and not just have you know them come and give the spiel that they give at all their book signings or something. We want to actually engage them. So it's a uh, you know more or less preparing like we would for a graduate seminar. So that's you know certainly several hours uh, I would say over over those three weeks. And then after we record it, which the uh, so yeah on the technical side. We're all in different places, and the guests that we get involved are also in different places around the country, even overseas we've done some. So uh, everybody, we talk over Skype, but then I try to get everybody to record themselves locally, and there's you know, cheap to free software readily available so that we can get our guests, you know, as long as they have a... Uh, we haven't actually 
just brought any in by phone, having Skype call their phones. We've, we've, it's, so it's been a little challenging that the guests have to have a certain level of technical sophistication so they can use, so we, we can talk them through how to record themselves with GarageBand on a Mac or uh, Audacity is a free program for a PC that they can use. So each person records themselves locally. I also, I record myself, I, I'm a musician background. So I've got multi-track software, which means my voice goes to one track and then actually the whole Skype feed goes to another track. So if somebody's audio doesn't work for some reason, I do have a backup. That would just be disastrous to talk for three hours and have that not the case. But it almost always works. And in the times that it doesn't, I'm able to isolate that person's voice. The uh, on the backup track, the, the advantage to having everybody on their own track is because, well, it's not, we don't use the, the video part of Skype, so we're just listening to each other. It's inevitable that we're going to interrupt each other a lot, uh, and that's fine. It, it's just more, if two people start to talk at the same time, someone will stop. <laughs> and then I will, in my multi-track program, I, everybody sends me their files. We use Dropbox or something like that. Uh, and, uh, and, and try to keep these files as high quality as possible. So we use actually the FLAC format, F-L-A-C, which is a lossless compression as opposed to MP3, just to, for people to send me things, because otherwise it's a full gig for one of these two-hour files that they're uh, recording. Sure, sure. Yeah, you do, you do, you, compared to any podcaster that I've interviewed, <laughs> you are spending a lot of time on producing your show. So I just want people to have a perspective on that. You're doing it the pretty... You're doing it a very professional way in terms of state of the art. <laughs> if yes, if only there were <laughs> easier. I, I'm sure that the technology will continue to improve. You know, I would love to just be able to record the Skype feed and have that be an adequate uh, thing. I, actually, but the, the, there are often Skype affectations and things that you, you know, you definitely want to have the local recordings if you can. In terms of straight audio quality, I was happy to, to learn recently that. The newer MacBooks, at least, just a built-in mic that's right on them is actually pretty darn it's good. It's not bad at all, I know. And, you know, I've, I've rec- I'm not doing it now, but I've recorded shows just on my iPhone earbuds, huh. you know? Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. If, if you keep the little cord with the microphone on it from moving around, it actually sounds pretty good on Skype. But much better to do it with, with a professional microphone. And Skype, when it works is pretty good. <laughs> I will say okay. since, since Microsoft bought it, at least my own experience is that Skype has become buggy. <laughs> ah. Like so many other Microsoft products. <laughs> yes. People. Well, so I do the layering and disambiguate when we're talking on top of each other. I can easily silence things or if somebody's typing or flipping pages, I can just take all that extra noise out. You know, actually after I treat each of the tracks individually for just the hiss, you know, there's just some algorithms you can apply to, to make things quieter. You don't want to overdo it, but you can, you can make, even if somebody has a kind of a bad setup, I can make it okay. And then uh, mix it all together. So then I have this, you know, stereo two, three hour file, and then usually divide it up among the other podcasters. And actually we started group sourcing this, that we have enough fans that were, you know, I just put up a blog post. Does anybody want to help us uh, with editing, you know, if somebody has sound experience, and we got about five volunteers immediately. So isn't was, isn't that great? You're crowdsourcing yes. your own audience, <laughs> and you're getting them to volunteer to help you with the show. I love it. That's just awesome. Yes, totally yes. Awesome. So you know, I still have to. I, I it's so far we've just started doing that recently, and so far it has not honestly saved me any time because I still have to go through all the individual files, and I'm kind of coaching these people to make them all obey my standard. But I was having that same issue with even the other podcasters uh, doing it. So I, I always have the, the last go over and it's, it's a very time consuming process. The actual edit, we, we get, I, I just want I just want people yep. to understand that they don't have to do all of this. <laughs> you're you're really going out of your way, okay, compared to many podcasters. So I, I just want them to keep that in mind, okay. <laughs> but go I, ahead. I, I feel like you know I the first ep- first few episodes I edited entirely myself, and again having a music background and being used to sitting in front of a computer, like listening really carefully. Oh, should I move this bass drum a millisecond to the right? This this kind of close up uh, studio stuff. So this is just where my brain is at. Um, and I, and so, you know, even all the ums and you knows and start to say something and then say something else, I just try to remove all that dross. And even to the point, it eventually got where if people just say, well, you might think that, and then they say what they want to say, I'll remove the, the preface. I just want the informational content. It's a really strip, strip it bare bones. And so that ends up taking, you know, certainly between my time and the other folks time, you know, s- certainly three hours or four hours for every hour that I record. So it's not a, it's, 
yeah, again, it's probably not necessary. I, after I had done it myself, being that anal with it, the first few episodes, I got, I started farming it out to the other guys and kind of let them use their judgment. And we immediately got at least one comment saying, oh no, they've lost their mojo. And I interpreted that as to say, I was right that I, that having the really streamlined presentation, it just makes us sound much smarter than we are. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> That's great. I love it. Much literally quicker on the update. Y- yes. You know, I, w- I want to ask you two two points that I really want to get with the listeners. First of all, tell us about your audience size and the growth of it. How did it start? Your first couple of episodes, what happened? What was the progression of growth? And, and where are you now in terms of your number of downloads, subscribers, and so forth? Well, I have my stats for our current server. We were on a different server for the first six months or so. And, 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 very... and before you jump into that, what are you using? What software are you using uh, to... So Libsyn is a is the a podcast hosting service, and the, the good thing about them is they only charge for the space that you take up. They don't charge for bandwidth at all, so it doesn't matter how popular you get. They won't charge you any more for that. They only charge for how much space you take up on their servers within a given month. So once something has been up a month, it'll they'll ship it to their backup server, and you don't get charged for that anymore. Stuff stays in the backup server. I guess forever. I don't know if I stop being their customer, if those will go away. I'm not totally clear about that, but certainly, uh, you know, so, so it's just, it's very reasonable, you know, $12 or $24, depending on how often you're posting per month to, to get, you know, our, our two episodes a month up there that, that we had the $12 plan for a long time. And that was perfectly sufficient, even though again, it's, they're long episodes. We post them at full, what CD quality, MP3, 128 kilobytes per second. Uh, so that's, yeah, that's, that's worked out very well. I had, I had originally hosted on just a, a friend of mine had a server. And once we started getting enough traffic, it was, oh, uh, well, maybe I should start paying him something. And it wasn't, re- so it was great to find Libsyn that, that with this, this plan that they had that really enabled us to grow. So for a long time, I'm looking at the, you know, for, for most of 2010, I guess we started March, April, 2010, it's very low. It's, uh, I see what, 140 subs- uh, listens, 49 downloads, five downloads on some of the days. It, it, so it so let me tell five. you, I, I bet you didn't get too excited about that, right? <laughs> well, I, you know, we were, honestly, this is just something that we wanted to do. I, I wasn't sure how much the appeal was going to be. I see one, we had our first huge jump on uh, February 2010. All right, sorry, it's the end of 2009 we were doing this. It, 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 where we got 842 downloads in a day, and that was just a a huge thing. It actually, we really didn't, compl- it was, it's been a pretty gradual growth since then. We really broke in just December of this year where we started going from, uh, I guess before that we were getting maybe two or 3000 downloads on the day that we would post something sort of on our, on our highlight day. And then yeah, it would that, go. That's good. That's good. Yeah. 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 But then, then suddenly it was, I see 8,000 for one day. We got up to 9,500 something was our peak on one day. And that happened because we got, because iTunes finally featured us because, uh, and I, and I'm actually pretty sure this is a, a friend of mine runs uh, the very popular blog, openculture.com. So they post links to mostly YouTube videos, but it just well, culturally important people talking about things. So it's, it's some philosophy, but it's more other things. And he's got you know, a million subscribers literally, and it does very well. So he was a, uh, I was able to work with him and write a few blog posts for him in return for getting to mention some episodes that we had. So that actually led to us being discovered by somebody at iTunes, actually the guy that runs the iTunes U department. And apparently he alerted, listened to us and liked what we were doing and alerted the podcast folks. So we got put, I suppose we were in the new and notable section on the front page right when we came out, but I don't. And, and that, 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 kicked that. You up, that kicked you up to 9,500 downloads in one day then uh, when you yeah, were featured? Yeah, okay. once that was when we were featured there. And then we've been, since then, uh, the last few months have been also pretty big because we've, we've been in different spots. They, they uh, you know, of their own accord, made one of the extra wide icons to put sort of in the wallpaper of the iTunes store page. Uh, when you go to the podcast page, which I, I didn't know how people got in that position. Right now, we're on the staff recommendations section. And, you know, once that started, now we do, we were already doing fairly well in our category. Uh, but there are a lot of things because in iTunes, you just sign up for whatever category you want. So there are a lot of things that are philosophy that are uh, signed up as philosophy that are not philosophy at all. They're, they're, you know, a survival podcast or a knitting podcast. It's just somebody thought this was one of the good 
categories to put yourself in. And so those, we were competing against those things. And some of those, the, you know, how the, stuff the, works. I, I, I love it. The philosophy yeah. of knitting. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's, we're yeah, knitting. Right. We're talking about stuff. Isn't right. that what philosophy no, is? No, I get it's, it. Yeah, stuff. totally. So it's, uh, <laughs> right. So, so it's been a good and a, a bad thing in terms of, um, you know, having an identifiable – I don't know what we do if we didn't have an identifiable niche like that. There actually is a philosophy category. So we're, you know, at the top of that this week at least, but you know, I don't know, I, I guess the, the, the heading over that is society and culture, like who browses through society and culture. So it doesn't really matter that we're on the, if we're in the top 10 society and culture podcasts, uh, that's. So, so the, the take home of what you're saying is pick your category wisely because that may help you get featured. It, it will help people search for you and so forth. Now I, I've got to ask you though, you were originally probably entered school and, and took up the philosophy major to be a professor or at least be a teacher of some sort. What is your day job? If you have one, I mean, the, the podcast, isn't a money maker yet, but you know, I kind of have a feeling in the direction you're going, it may become one. That is our hope. Yes. No, I, I do still right now, transportation research consulting. So I, you know, it's already a, a work from home setup. I work mostly with out of state clients. So, a, you know, a few calls and working on their projects and managing other people working on their projects. And have that's, you, uh, I've, I've just got to ask you because I've branched out into so many different kinds of podcasts, different shows that I do. I've, my own thing is I've got about 500 episodes now in 15 different shows, but right. certainly my first show, it was my main show and it still is. It's, it's been very successful, got a good following on that one. But have you ever thought of doing a show on transportation consulting or some of your other areas? You know, maybe that would be more easily monetizable possibly. Just a thought. I mean, there's been discussion in our, you know, it's just a small consulting company of actually doing exactly what you're talking about. You know, it, we're, it's because we're consultants, we bill some organization for every hour we work. So just doing a podcast that's not for anybody in particular is not uh, an exact money making situation. Uh, and, but it does provide a really good groundwork, actually, a good benchmark. I mean, can I. It, if I'm going to extend what I'm doing in the podcasting area and in philosophy or trying to create additional products to sell, which we fooled around with that, uh, you know, unfortunately on iTunes, it's not nearly as easy to, you know, create for sale content and put that, you know, to, with your free content. So, you know, I've just been created a few auxiliary audio things to put on the website, but it all comes down to, am I getting paid to do that extra stuff as much as I'm is the time that I'm taking from my day job. So that's, you know, this is a, there's an objective. I can see if somebody's just coming out of college or, or you know, much a different situation, being able to, to put a lot more time into that. Yeah, I, I, I like having this be my intellectual space. I mean, we have, we have besides the, uh, the podcast, we've, we've got a blog that we use to give people a place to go and talk more about these things. We have, uh, so we try to get between us and different guests we've had on the show to put up, you know, at least a post a day, which is mostly links to resources on the internet, very much taking from the ultra open culture uh, model that's been so successful for, for my friend there. So yeah, so th there's definitely more just researching possible topics and writing about things we've already posted about that, that you know, that takes plenty of my time. And, uh, and then that's sort of been the problem that I'm not in terms of monetizing things that we, there, there are measures we can take that lives in, uh, our hosting service offers some options and things, but it's been hard for us to concentrate on that. Yeah, right. No, sure. And, 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 you know, the nice thing about podcasting is you're, you're basically doing what you love. You're doing your hobby. It's cathartic, I assume, because you, you get to talk about this stuff and, and maybe, oh, yeah. you know, maybe your spouse isn't into it or your significant other isn't into it. And, and, you know, you get to, you get an outlet. So, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great thing just in and of itself there. But what does Libsyn do in terms of monetization possibilities? Are they, uh, do they have advertisers where they, they allow hosts to put their advertising content on there and kind of aggregate that for you. What is their monetization uh, opportunity? For the most part, I would refer people to just go look at their site. That's libsyn.com. But I, I can tell you the experiences we've had is that they they work with a number of advertisers, Audible being one of them. So we've done a few Audible ads where you know they do the middle. They're they're the middlemen. They work with the the, the advertisers, and then it's just the the cost is split. However, there's a, for most of these deals, the advertiser always pays for a certain maximum number of downloads. So if you grow beyond that point or you leave the ad on there for two more years and quadruple your audience, you're not going to get paid anymore for that. So that's something that we're 
we've, we've played around with. I'm not sure how much further we're going to go in that direction. They also offer something called uh, ad stitching, which enables you to, you know, they actually come up with the ads. You don't have to read them. You just have to get, uh, have, we, we had our listeners fill out, uh, you have to have 250 of your listeners to fill out a demographic survey, which is, was a, kind of a hard sell because it's, you know, put your email address and your income level and your education level. Uh, but we did that. We got that hoop. So now we're in the running that they can pitch us to other advertising campaigns who then to, to stitch it thing. It wouldn't just be with the current episode. It would be for all 54 episodes that are posted, which that is a huge, cause we get, you know, a hundred thousand downloads a month when we consider all of the episodes combined. But if we're just looking at the current episode, then it's more like 20,000 or 15,000 at this point. So that's, that's going to be hopefully a, a very bigger deal. And they, they automatically stitch that in. You go to where you have your files posted on their server and you can just tell them, you know, do it at the beginning or the end, or you can actually manually specify this spot, this spot, and this spot in your file. And then they will after you approve the advertiser and approve the advertisement, then I guess just as people downloaded it, this, this, or maybe they go and replace your file temporarily with this slightly longer file that has their stuff in it. And once the campaign is over, then it goes back to the way it was. So that's the advantage of that, that you're only paying. It's not cumulative that if we read an ad on every single one, but then ended up doing the stitching thing later, then, well, we have twice as much advertising, half of which we're not getting paid for. But for this, it's just, the advertiser pays for a two-month slot, and so for that two months, that ad is on all of your episodes, and then it's just removed. So that's a very, it's a very little work from us to get that done. Now, it has taken us a long time working with them to actually start that, and we have yet to, to even try out this service that I'm telling you about. So Let me take a brief pause. We'll be back in just a minute. You know, Penny, sometimes I think of Jason Hartman as a walking encyclopedia on the subject of creating wealth. Well, you're probably not far off from the truth, Britch. Jason actually has a six-book set on creating wealth that comes with over 100 hours of the most comprehensive ideas on investing in business. They're in high-quality digital download audio format, ready for your car, iPod, or wherever you want to learn. Yes, and by the way, he's recently added another book to the series that shows you investing the way it should be. This is a world where anything less than a 26% annual return is disappointing. Jason actually shows us how we can be excited about these scary times and exploit the incredible opportunities this present economy has afforded us. We can pick local markets that are untouched by the economic downturn, exploit packaged commodities investing, and achieve exceptional returns safely and securely. I like how he teaches us how to protect the equity in your home before it disappears and how to outsource your debt obligations to the government. He's recorded interviews with Harry Dent, Peter Schiff, Robert Kiyosaki, Pat Buchanan, Catherine Austin Fitz, Dr. Dennis Waitley, T. Harv Ecker, and so many others who are experts on the economy, on real estate, and on creating wealth. And the entire set of advanced strategies for wealth creation is being offered with a savings of $385. Now to get your Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series complete with over 100 hours of audio and six books, go to jasonhartman.com forward slash store. If you want to be able to sit back and collect checks every month, just like a banker, Jason's Creating Wealth Encyclopedia series is for you. Now, what are, what are your other thoughts just before we go on monetization? I mean, I'm sure you've thought about some things. It doesn't sound like you're pressuring yourself a lot to think about that, but, you know, I'm sure it's crossed your mind, you and, and your co-host. What other thoughts have you had? Advertising is one. Have you thought of doing maybe a, a course or a product that's maybe a home study course or anything like that? Sure. Well, the next, I mean, I, I sort of created this new format uh, that I just, put out the, the sort of prototype recently, which was this uh, a paid-for audio product called a close reading, where it would just be me, and I would just read through it a really, really hard philosophy text, and then stop every sentence to sort of talk about what this means. So it's a, it's a little more select audience. You know, it's for people that are kind of want the more hardcore, whereas, you know, it's, it's more of a joking in tangents experience on the regular podcast. This is more, you know, Sartre is very hard to understand. How can I do that? So this is a you know, I think this has great potential and I want to try to get other people to do these as well, you know, experts in the various areas and I'll split the cost with that. So that's one idea we've thrown out. 
that I think is very promising. Also, we've talked about doing some kind of book, doing an ebook, you know, done versions of these little things. So I think there's a lot of room to put products. We also just ask for donations, and, and we do pretty well as far as that's concerned. You know, do you care not, to share any of that? I mean, I'd love to know. You know, it's a, it's a couple wise. hundred dollars a month at this point. It's not, but it's... It's, it's certainly it's more a, than covers you know, expenses, though. Certainly. I mean, our expenses are, are generally pretty low. Uh, you know, as we have more money, of course, we can do more things in terms of advertising in other places. We haven't really looked so much into that. But, you know, some of the money has gone to update our website. I just think it's important to put some of your time and energy into constantly just trying to make everything more accessible and, and easier to take and uh, uh, just improving the overall professionalism of the product. We've also talked about you know, something like a premium service that we have these people that donate money. Well, let's create a recurring donation. And then, well, what can we offer them on top of that? Well, maybe we could have a, uh, I will get on Skype with 20 people and just talk about the episode that we just have. Well, we could record that and sell that as well. So there's all, there's definitely been talk of, we should actually do conferences and take this on the road. I don't think I don't think our audience is anywhere near where that would be financially feasible, given that we're at four different places around the country right now. Right, but. right. Yeah, fair enough. But it's it's just stuff to think about. The conferences are hard because that's, again, that's a physical thing, and it's a lot of work to do live events. Uh, you know, sure. there's, there's financial commitments and so forth. But you could certainly host your things at various universities and so forth, and I bet I bet you could make that fairly inexpensive given your topic area. It's just a thought. There's all these there's all these great things, and you know, some of the ideas I've found, they basically come from your audience and from your listeners. Kind of the way you're crowdsourcing your audience to help you with editing the shows. That's fantastic. I mean, I love it. I love right. It. I know some people have been successful with Kickstarter. We've been playing around with that idea of just, you know, having having a I, I interviewed uh, a podcaster yep. yesterday that uh, they 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 went to Kickstarter and and you know again folks this is not big money we're talking about but again it can turn into something big they went to Kickstarter and they asked for twenty five hundred dollars for their podcast they got thirty eight hundred dollars more than they wanted and they for how do you know for how long like for six months of it or for a year or just sort of in general. You know, I don't know the answer to that that question. That's the Uh, math I'm trying to figure out. Yeah, however, here's what I will tell you, is they've only spent about a third of the money so far. And and their show has been taking off and doing well. It's it's fairly new, but it got featured. It's still featured, actually. I looked yesterday on iTunes, and it's doing great. So, yeah, well, good stuff. Well, anything you'd like people to know in closing about why they should podcast or, you know, any technical things on on how to do it better, marketing ideas, whatever you'd like to share. I don't know. I think a lot of it was just a matter of coming up with a, a good idea and good people to work with in the first place that that I, I just felt like this particular thing of of uh, being in a graduate seminar and talking about that kind of stuff afterward was not something that people generally had exposure to that a lot of the philosophy sites and things out there were were v- just too unstructured just you know just a forum where just anybody who has nothing you know the idea of actually reading a text talk you know so there would be something to talk about so it wouldn't just be us being you know, goofing around. So I think so much of it just came, you know, just put most of your effort into creating the product in the first place. I think that the marketing and, and all these strategies, as you're saying that you know, there's so many of these things floating out there. And as if what you're doing is actually good, then it will sooner or later get out there. Uh, you know, I can't, I can't say if, if we were creating a strictly a comedy podcast, say, where there's so much more competition, where every single stand-up comedian that's ever been on a stage is now has their own podcast. I don't know if no matter how good that kind of thing was, if, I, if, if it would eventually get the audience that it deserves, but we found a niche that that should be something that other people you know, can draw on their own experience maybe to find something that's comparable. Fantastic. Well, Mark, the Partially Examined Life podcast, thank you so much for sharing these ideas with with everybody today. And keep up the good work. Congratulations on your success. All right. Thank you, Jason. Copyright the Hartman Media Company. For publication rights and interviews, please email media at jasonhartman.com. This show offers very general information. Opinions of guests are their own. Nothing contained herein should be considered personalized, personal, financial, investment, legal, or tax advice. Every investor's strategy and goals are unique. You should consult with a licensed real estate broker or agent or other licensed investment, tax, and or legal advisor before relying on any information contained herein. Information is not guaranteed. 
please call 714-820-4200 and visit www.jasonhartman.com for additional disclaimers, disclosures, and questions.